Good, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing today? Woo! Video game up here. So, so uh, I'm glad to see you. Hopefully I don't get uh, buzzed out and I lose. So uh, I don't know. You guys maybe think hopefully I do get buzzed out and lose. I'm talking about the video game. Anyways, so uh, I'm glad you guys are here. Welcome. My name is David. Uh, more importantly, it's all about Jesus. Period. So uh, good to see you guys. Bright, smiling faces. Lively worship. I do agree. Come back tonight. Uh, we'll have an amazing time. Uh, if you're on the broadcast, you can come back tonight too. Uh, we want you to be here, worship, celebrate. So uh, we're glad you're here. Thanks for attending on the broadcast out there in Pajama World. We're glad you guys are here and uh, on the patio. Yeah. Thanks for attending out there. Uh, it's hot out there, but we're glad you guys are here as well. And thanks for attending in your car. If you're in driving, listening, uh, we're glad you're with us this morning. And thanks for attending in here. Hello. Good to see you. Woo. You can't let the patio beat you guys. Come on. Yeah. What's up with that? So uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here. And uh, hey, Hilltop made the paper. Did you see that? No? I hope you didn't see it, but some of you did see it. If you are old enough to still read the paper, so uh, I'm not talking about the toilet paper dictionary of the day. I'm talking about the actual newspaper. Uh, yeah, we made the hill, uh, the the whatever, whatever it's called here today, Lake Havasu something. Yes, Herald, the Herald. We made the Herald, but it was not good news. So uh, yeah, we we did we kind of got slammed a little bit, but uh, it was on our uh, building, so we had a zoning meeting. So uh, there were some issues with the zoning meeting, and the newspaper said that Hilltop was not prepared and did, was not ready. So uh, just let me inform you that we were 100% prepared and ready. There was a communication breakdown. We don't want to accuse anybody. We're happy to take the blame. We'll take it. Uh, we don't want to accuse anybody. But there was something between our architect and the city paperwork issue, and uh, the, no one was pointing fingers, but someone messed up. But the paper said it was us. But uh, okay, sure. Whatever. Well, I just want you to know we were 100% ready, but uh, if it's any, any consolation, uh, normally when this happens, you have to wait a whole nother month and the city pushes you back. But the city said, in this situation, we'll rush to get you back in for a new zoning meeting. So maybe... Maybe that shows you something. So anyways, big things are coming. Just keep looking for that. Big things are coming. But I just want to let you know, uh, you know, the newspaper, it's not all true. It is good fiction sometimes. So just remember what you read. But anyways, I don't know who wrote the article. We have no hate towards them. We love them. So uh, things just happen. But anyways, anyways, it's all about Jesus, period. Uh, anyways, we love Jesus. Jesus is doing awesome stuff. But hey, how many of you have ever run out of cruise ship? Who's gone out of cruise? Where's the... Yeah, woo, oh, with celebration people, yeah. yeah. At home, you can raise your hand, but I can't see you and be jealous, right? Uh, cruises, right? So a lot of you have been on cruises. Those are all the retired people there. Um, I've never been on a cruise, but my dad's been on cruise, and he says there's nothing but old people on them, and he's 80. So, uh, so okay, dad, right? It's just nothing but old people on them. You know why? Because young people are working. Anyway, so... Uh, yeah, cruise, cruise ships. People love cruise ships. Uh, people tell my wife and I all the time, you got to go on a cruise ship. You got to go on a cruise ship. And I'm always like, why do we have to go on a cruise ship? And they're like, oh, the food. The food. There's just mounds of food. I'm like, I don't have problems in the food department, man. Uh, but apparently you got to go on this cruise ship. Apparently people love just gorging themselves 24-7. I don't know what's going on on a cruise ship. So uh, apparently there's just food everywhere. And uh, you're just getting fat and enjoying it. So uh some people like uh, cruise ships because you get pampered. And if you like the pampering, oh, yeah, you didn't, didn't even have to raise a hand. You heard it. Oh, yeah. So, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Maybe some of you are on broadcast. You're on a cruise ship right now. I don't know. Uh, people like being pampered, right? They like uh, waking up and not having to make the bed, and someone else makes it for you, and someone picks up your dirty underwear. That's gross. But anyways, you know, I don't know. Picks it up for you, and someone serves you. Uh, someone brings you drinks at the pool. Uh, non-alcoholic drinks, I know, we're in church, right? So uh, they bring you, yeah, right, thank you, amen, that's right. Uh, so, and, and they bring it to you, and people love being pampered, uh, they just love the ship takes them where they want to go, you know, where do you want to go? I want to go here, let's go to this island, I'm going to have fun, and then I'll just get back on the boat and bring me a drink, right? Uh, this is, people, people love cruise ships, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, uh, people just love it, right? Uh, Everybody taking care of you, pampering you, doing what you want. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the cruise ship attitude has slipped into the church a little bit. The church has a little bit of a cruise ship mindset. You know, this idea that, uh, uh, you know, everybody's just going to take care of me. 
And some of you, you know, now I'm not hearing amens now. What happened? Yeah, so it's just, you guys tuned out, right? But I mean, like this cruise ship attitude of like, well, I'm just going to show up to church whenever. I know it starts, but pff, I'm just going to pull in the parking lot. And then when I show up, you know, what? There's no upfront parking spots? What kind of church is this? What time do these people get here? And then we just stroll in and look for our seat. Someone's in my seat. Don't they know my butt cheeks have been sitting there, you know, for, I mean, two weeks at least. Come on, what's going on, right? You know, there's three services. Someone else sits in your seat, so it's not just yours. Uh, move around, people. It's okay. Some of you do. I'd like to look for you. Anyways, but... Uh, you know, people show up like, oh, I want the church to be very welcoming, and I want to be friendly, but I want my amenity. And I'm like, what? So you want the church to be friendly and welcoming, but you want amenity at the same time. Yes, I want everybody to talk to me, but only when I want to talk to them. And they should know the line without me telling them. Right? It's like, well, that's kind of a hard line, you know? I got to be friendly, but not too friendly, right? I, well, you're at the wrong church if we're looking for amenity. People are just going to come up and hug you. Welcome! You know, it's your first time. How you doing? It scares me, too, and I've been here a while. Anyways, right? Whoa, hey. Good to see you. I, I don't know, right? Uh, you know, it's great. Uh, a lot of us, we, you know, we love to sit around and watch 20% of the people do 100% of the work. You know, I don't come to church to do anything. I come here, you know, I expect, I expect to hear some good music. I expect to laugh a little bit, maybe hear a little bit about the Bible, but don't preach anything too, too touchy because I'm going to get offended then. And the slightest little thing that offends me, well, I'm jumping, I'm going to another ship. I'm going to take care of ships. I'm going to go to ships that can take care of me. And we get this cruise ship mentality sliding in. Oh, and heavens forbid, don't ask me to pay a dime. You know, even the cruise ship charges you. And they charge you pretty good. You got to pay to be pampered. But I want to come to church and I want to be pampered. And you better not charge me one dime. What? Talk about money. Pastor just wants a raise. Yes, I want a raise. All right? Yeah. I got two kids in college and one on their way. I need a raise, for crying out loud. Anyways, I'm, I'm already broke. So, uh, yes, and that's not ending anytime soon. So, right, yeah, I mean, I mean, people get upset. We got bent out of shape, right? We pay for everything in life, but church should be 100% free, and I shouldn't have to give anything to it, and you better not even talk about it, or I'm going to another cruise ship. Guess what? That cruise ship's going to talk about it, too, because they have lights, too. Uh, you need to turn them on. Cruise ship mentality. This is not what church is supposed to be. This is not how God designed church. It's not a cruise ship. If you're here expecting to be just fully enjoyed and pleasurable, you're going to be disappointed. I'm going to offend you at some point because I'm going to tell you we're not a cruise ship. We're not here for your pleasure. We're here for Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus, period. We're here for him. Now, uh, the Bible gives us a great illustration of what the church is like and kind of what happens to us when we come to church. And that's in uh, 1 Samuel. If you have your Bibles, you can pull out 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel is kind of a, maybe you've never read 1 Samuel. It is an awesome, awesome book. I encourage you to read it. Uh, but it's kind of in the middle, Old Testament, middle of your Bible section. Uh, if you get to Proverbs, you've gone too far, go to your left, right? But uh, for everybody else, it will just be on the screen. Uh, you can just read it up there. But 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1. This is what it says. It says, after David had finished talking to Saul, now let me stop you there. After David had finished talking to Saul, two names there, David, Saul. David, uh, if you've been in the church world, you know, um, even if you haven't, you may have heard this story, but if you haven't, it's okay. But David is the guy, the boy who threw the sling and killed the giant, right? We kind of hear this story. It's kind of a popular story even in the world. A David slaying the giant. And we're always the little guy slaying the big guys. But sometimes we're the big giant jerk too. You know, we get slayed. But anyways, so this is David, shepherd boy, right? Uh, and Saul, he is the first king of Israel. But he's a bad dude. Nobody likes him. Bad dude. So you hear Saul, you go, ooh, yes, ooh, all right, right? Uh, so after David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, third character here, Jonathan, the king's son, firstborn. There was an immediate bond between them, for Jonathan loved David. That's what the text says. Now, let me stop you here for a second. Jonathan loved David. Uh, the world that we live in has a issue with 
hijacking words. And then they take those words and they manipulate them and they twist them. And once they've done that, then they reassert that word, reinsert that word into the Bible, and then begin to try to define the Bible with the new hijacked word. The word love is one of those words that have been hijacked by the world. We now hear the word love, and almost all of us, because it's been hijacked and we've accepted this as, okay, we've allowed that word to be defined as sex, right? We hear the word love, they're in love. Well, that means they're having sex. They love each other, they're having sex. Well, that's not true. That's a wrong definition of the word love. Love does not mean sex. Sex means sex. Right? There's two different things. Two different things. And, and I have a really good friend named Jamie, and I love him. And let me tell you, we are not having sex. <laughs> it's not happening. You are not that good looking, Jamie. Right? It's not happening, right? Not happening. And so a lot of people read this text right here, and they see Jonathan love David, and they say, oh, it's a homosexual relationship. That is not true. It doesn't say it. Some people say, oh, well, see, this endorses homosexuality in the Bible. No, you're using a hijacked word, love, redefining it, and then inserting it and interpreting the Bible off of it. Love does not mean sex. There is an intimate relationship that this is talking about. The, the love here that it's referring to is more of foxhole buddies. You heard this term? Uh, men who are in the war together. You think of uh, World War II, the greatest generation, right? Why are they the greatest generation? Because they stood up and they put down tyranny and they did it together and a lot of people died. Right? That's why they're the greatest generation, uh, you know. God did awesome things. Well, two guys sat in a foxhole together while people were trying to kill them. And they said, we can only depend on each other. I got your back. You got my back. And we're going to defend ourselves. And if we come out of this alive, praise Jesus. And they did it together. And when you have that experience where someone's trying to kill you and you're defending each other and you have one man on your backside and you're firing this way and he's firing that way and you just got to depend on each other and you go through that, you come of that hole and you say, I love that man. And there was no sex involved. It was a bonding that happens. I love that man, and I will die for that man. And they already proved it. That's the kind of love this is talking about. It has absolutely nothing to do with sex. Do not let the world hijack what God is trying to tell us. That is a trap from the devil. Trap from the devil. First Samuel chapter 18, verse 2, it says, From that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. And Jonathan made a solemn pact with David. A solemn pact, right? Jonathan's making a covenant with David. And it's very much like the covenant that Jesus Christ makes with us when we give him our life. This is why it's important and teaches us about the church. Jonathan made a solemn pact with David. Why? Because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan sealed this pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David together with his tunic, sword, bow, and belt. Whew, he gave him a lot, right? This is, this is a strong covenant. Uh, David and Jonathan, what's happening is they're entering into a partnership. A partnership. Now again, some people don't like the word partner. I get it. You know why? Because the world has hijacked the word partner and have manipulated that into a sexual relationship. Well, hello, what? So I didn't know when you open a business with someone and you become a partnership, and we even in tax codes, I know we hate that word, but tax codes, right? we have this agreement about people partnering together. That has nothing to do with sex. Right? It has to do with we're joining together. A partnership is when two people or multiple people unite together on a common mission. They say, we understand where we're going, and we're going to join together, and we're going to do it together. And then we all contribute resources to accomplish that mission. And then we all share in the profit or the loss of that mission. And we all have a responsibility to the outcome of that mission. That is a partnership. No sex involved. That, that's, sex is involved, right? 
So we need to understand, don't let the devil manipulate us and take a word and twist it into something that it's not. Stand on the foundation of God and his scripture and understand what he's telling us here. Partnership. Jonathan and David enter in this par- partnership. And this partnership, what is it? Uh, it's an example of our responsibility in the church because when we give our life to Jesus, we are joining together, we are partnering with him. And now we have shared responsibility. We have a, a responsibility to, to use our resources to bring about his mission and his glory. That's what the church is. And we unite with other believers. So you're not just here by yourself. You're here in this room. You're here on the patio. You're here in the broadcast. You're with us. We're together in your car. We are one church in different places, but we are united in our mission, and we're sharing our resources, and we're responsible for what happens and the outcomes, and we share in the victories, and we share in the defeats, and we keep driving forward. That's a partnership. This is what Jonathan and David are doing. Verse 18, it says, uh, uh, chapter 18, verse 4, it says, Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David. Now, this is very significant because uh, uh, some people read this and go, well, there you go. uh, Jonathan's getting naked. He's taking off his clothes. Whoa, what kind of movies you've been watching? Clean your mind out, right? Uh, Get get out of the gutter. No, no, what he's doing is taking off his robe. It's See, we hear robe and we automatically think, what mom wears when she gets out of bed and runs to the bathroom or, you know, or, or someone's crying in the other room for one of the kids. And so mom throws on a robe and she runs in there. What's wrong, honey? Because dad's like pretending he's asleep. I didn't, I didn't hear nothing. I didn't hear anything. Go, you go. Hey, honey, wake up. Are you awake? You hear that? Okay, I'm asleep. Anyways, right? Now that's not what we're talking about. That's not what the text is talking about here. You need to think in terms of a coat, okay? Like a coat. You all have worn a coat. And when you take off your coat, you're not naked, You have clothes underneath that coat, right? So when you take off your coat, you're not naked. You take off your coat, and he gave it, his coat, his robe, to Jonathan. Now, this is important because the robe was significant. The robe was a poshy, Gucci, high-class robe. This is like a robe that a prince, a prince of the king would be wearing. So when people saw this robe, they'd be like, whoa, someone's dropped some Bing, bing, ka-ching, ka-ching. I don't know all the proper words. You guys have to get me cool on that stuff anyway. So, right, right. It's a, right it's, and so, this is a nice, people would have seen it right away. Woo, you know, you ladies, you carry those purses. And guys have no clue about a purse. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. But women are like, ooh, look at that purse. Oh, nice, nice. And then you buy your imitation purses to look just like the real thing, you know. I got this. Where? Chinatown. That's right. Back alley. They look real, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what you you notice. And so this robe would have identified David. And when people saw the robe, they would have said, that's the son of the king. Remember, they looked alike. They had beards. You know, they, they blended in. So the robe would have made him stand out. It identified him. The robe identified Jonathan as a prince. The robe identified Jonathan as a prince. So as David wears it, people are going to identify David as Jonathan. And guess what comes with that? All the responsibilities and authority that a prince would have. David was just a shepherd boy. If he wanted to go someplace, whoa, you're just a shepherd boy. You're not allowed in. But now he's wearing the robe of Jonathan and shows up. People see the robe and go, he's no longer a shepherd boy. He's a prince. Come on in to the front of the line. Enter. You can get in anywhere. But you also have the responsibility that comes with being a prince. I mean, this is an important robe. Jonathan is saying a big thing when he puts this robe on David. Scripture says he also gave him his tunic. That's his shirt. The shirt was a high class, you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know, I don't know my clothes, so a silky, you know, expensive thread count, something, I don't know. Uh, I just speak in terms of sheets, I don't know really, but, uh, yeah, so. and so, you know, he puts on this shirt as well, so the shirt and the robe, now he's really, in fact, people would likely mistake David as Jonathan. They would see him and go, there's the son of the king, because he's wearing this robe. This is important, because when we give our life to Jesus Christ, As the church, he clothes us in his robe. 
Isaiah says this, Isaiah 61 verse 10, it says, I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for he has dressed me, he's dressed us with the clothing of salvation and draped us in a robe of righteousness. I am like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding or a bride with her jewels. This means if we're dressed in the robe of Christ, this means that people might look at us and identify us or confuse us to be Jesus Christ. Think about that for a second. You're out at Smith's parking lot, and people see you, and they look, there's Jesus walking through the parking lot. I didn't know he used that finger. Wow. <laughs> Woo. Yeah. Look, there's Jesus. You know, I didn't know he got so upset at stop signs. What's up, right? You know, this is why some of you don't put that little fish in your car. Scrip that fish off. I'm not letting people identify me, right? <laughs> because people might mistake Remember, we are the church. We, his children, are a representation of Jesus Christ. And when people see us, they might mistake us for Jesus. Why? Because he's robed us in his righteousness, in his truth, in his glory. And so we have a responsibility now to represent him as if we are children of the King of kings and Lord of lords. And Colossians tells us how to do that. 3, chapter 3, verse 12 since God chose us to be his holy to be the holy people he loves we must clothe ourselves with tender mercy kindness humility gentleness and patience oh we're in trouble verse 13 make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who has offended you remember the lord gave, forgave you so we must forgive others above all clothe yourself with love Again, define that word right or you're going to be mistaken, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Have you ever seen uh, the U.S. Navy guys in those all-white uniforms? We got any Navy people here? Where's our Navy people? All right, there's some. Where's your... Thank you very much, Navy guys. Uh, women, may... I, when I said guys, I meant generically. Uh, men or women, right? Men or women could be Navy. You see them in that white uniform, that all-white you know exactly who they are, don't you? I mean, you don't have to even get close. I mean, you see them at a distance, and you're like, whoa, you're in the U.S. Navy, aren't you? You know exactly what they stand for. You know exactly what they represent. You don't have to get close and say, oh, oh, what are, are you a doctor with that all-white uniform? Are you a nurse? No. No, you know right away, oh, that, that's a Navy man, right? And then you hear him talk, and he curses, and you go, okay, yeah, definitely a Navy man, right? Yeah, right, yeah. I mean, but we know who he is, we know who she is, we know who they represent, we know what they're about, we know what their job is, we know what their mission is, because we just look at the uniform and we know that is exactly how we should be. People should look at us and go, I know exactly who you are. I'm a, I'm a child of the living God. I'm a prince or princess to the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and he's clothed me. Here's the thing. The church is not a cruise ship. The church is a battleship. The church is on a mission. We're going somewhere, and we're all clothed in our king's uniform, and he's put us on mission, and we're all uniting together, and we all share a responsibility with where our battleship ends up, and we're going to attack. We're going to attack evil in this world and share the good news of Jesus Christ to save people's lives because we're at war, and we got a mission, and our king has clothed us as the church, to represent him. And you know what? Jesus doesn't mind if someone mistakenly identifies us as him. Man, what a blessing. Oh, man, there's David. He reminds me of Jesus. There's you. He reminds me of Jesus. That, that adds a lot of pressure, doesn't it? Or maybe I should use the right word, responsibility. Responsibility. Jonathan then gave David a sword and a bow. Uh, the weapons represent a commitment to defend and protect. The weapons represent a commitment to defend and protect. Same time. Th these are weapons of war. They're aggressive, right? Jonathan's telling David by giving him this, th these weapons that, hey, I'm promising to defend, I'm promising to attack, and I'm promising to use my resources to get behind to be with you. I'm going to be in that foxhole with you, and I'm not going anywhere, and I'm going to do what i got to do to be there with you. That's what we're telling Jesus. 
He's telling us that. I died on the cross. I shed my blood. I will even give you my blood, he said, and I will be with you forever. And then we join him and say, we're committed to you. We are your church, your bride. We're partnering with you, Jesus. Jesus gives us his sword, Ephesians 6, 17. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Oh, hey, maybe I should start saying this every Sunday. Pull out your sword. Pull out your sword, right? That's what this is. And remember, the sword is used offensively to attack, and the sword is used defensively to protect. This book right here, this book defends us, this book protects us, and we learn it and ingest it and live it, whew, it makes us a threat to our enemy in this world. He's scared of this book. He's scared of what it says. This is why the enemy wants to manipulate words and twist them so it twists our thinking of who God is. That's why we've got to stick to what it says. Jonathan also gave David a bow. A bow? Bow! Bow and arrows. He didn't give him any arrows. Get your own anyway. So, yeah. Ammo and supply store sells them, 10 cents. Know, it's just when I was a kid. Uh, what's interesting is, uh, I don't tell you guys this stuff much, but the Hebrew word, I know that really excites everybody, but the Hebrew word for bow, I find this is interesting, so I'm sharing it with you. The Hebrew word for bow right here in Samuel is the same Hebrew word that is used in Genesis chapter 9. Let me read it for you. It might sound be familiar. Genesis chapter 9, verse 13. God talking. I have placed my rainbow, same Hebrew word, the bow part. I have placed my rainbow in the clouds. It is a sign of my covenant with you and with all the earth. When I, sent, when I send clouds over the earth, the rainbow will appear. Have you ever seen a rainbow? Do you ever see a double rainbow? Beautiful, right? Ever see five rainbows? No, neither have I. I just thought I'd ask anyway. So. When I send, 14, when I send clouds over the earth, the rainbow will appear in the clouds. And I will remember, God speaking, I will remember my covenant with you and with all living creatures. Never again will the flood waters destroy the earth. When I see the rainbow in the clouds, I will remember the eternal covenant between God and every living creature on earth. The rainbow is a covenant that God bestowed upon us. Now, it's the same thing with the bow that Jonathan gave David. Same, he means the same thing. I'm making a covenant with you. Now, the rainbow is also something that has been hijacked and manipulated to represent a political agenda. Okay, it's a political agenda. It's not a sexual agenda. It's a political agenda. But just because people take things and manipulate it and twist it should not change what we know what it really means. It is a covenant of God saying, I will protect you forever. I have your back forever. And so when we see the rainbow, when you see a flag, when you see someone celebrating, we don't have to acknowledge that celebration, but the rainbow itself should remind us. Unfortunate they're twisted, but here's what it actually means. And praise God. Praise his name. Now, I'm not saying fly a rainbow flag. You send, the red message to, you send the wrong message to people. But the reality is we should be reminded of it's a covenant that God sent upon us. So when Jonathan gives his bow, he's making a covenant. As the church, when we give our lives to Jesus, we are entering into a partnership covenant with Jesus Christ as his church to say we are here. We're not a cruise ship, and when I get upset, I'm not abandoning ship. No, I'm in the foxhole with you, and we're going to have good times, and we're going to high-five and celebrate, and we're going to have really bad times, and we're going to have some tough conversations, and we're not going to abandon you. We're not going to run away and say, oh, it got hard. I'm going somewhere else. No, I am in this. I made a covenant with you, and I'm here, and we're going to get through this, and we're going to come out the other side, and we're going to be better. And we're not going to bail out. We're going to pour our resources into what's happening because we are a battleship moving in a direction and we have a mission to accomplish. And if you've been in the Navy, and some of you have, it's not always hunky-dory, is it? Sometimes it's, dare I say, sucks. You can say that in church. <laughs> Kids, you shouldn't say that. You need to talk to your mother first. Anyways, right? It's not always hunky-dory. But then we look up and see the rainbow and go, ah, I remember what it's about. Jesus Christ. Jonathan then gave David his belt. He gave him his belt. The belt was functional. 
The belt was functional, very functional, right? I'm wearing a belt now. I don't want to lift my shirt. I'll show you my fat belly, but I wear a belt, right? Why? It keeps my pants up. So the belt was used to wrap around the robe to keep the robe closed. Functional, right? It also had, like, usually a knife they would carry on it, maybe a dagger. Uh, it also had maybe a pouch with some money. It also had a pouch with some snacks. So think Batman, right? Think Batman. What do you need? Oh, yeah. Think mom's purse. Oh, you need a band-aid? I got a band-aid right here. Okay. Oh, yeah. Here's, here's, you know, women, you got all kinds of stuff in your purses, right? You're prepared. So that, that's the bell, right? The bell also had a status symbol with it. It was broided, embroidered uniquely. So in our terms, you've probably maybe seen like an Indian movie or been maybe the Navajo uh, people, and you see these embroidered uh, things, that, these beautiful things they've made. It's kind of like that, an embroidered belt that's put together and it's unique. And so they would wear this, and the belt would have symbols on it of military conquest, of things they've achieved, victories. So when people see the, the belt, they're like, oh, this is a bad dude. Don't mess with that dude, you know? Nowadays, you just, the guys with the big muscles and the tight shirts, that's a, he's a bad dude. Don't mess with him, right? Uh, but they wore a belt for that because scrawny dudes can be bad too. You just don't know. They don't, uh, that's right. Uh, right? So I've seen MMA. Those guys are tough too. So anyway, so, and so this belt is a symbol, and people recognize that. So when Jonathan gives David this belt, what he's saying is, my faith is in you that you are going to bring about many more victories. And so now with the belt and the robe and the tunic, definitely people are going to say, that's Jonathan. And they're going to say, he's a military leader, and I believe in him, and I trust him. And David grew to be a great military leader. And God's church, he wraps his belt around us because he knows there's many victories in store for us. Scripture says this, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 15, he uh, he, God, will wear righteousness like a belt and truth like undergarments. Truth is God's underwear. We should be clothed in his truth. We should wear his belt of righteousness. Why? Because we have partnered with him and he is our king and we have many battles that we are going to bring about victory. People are going to give their lives to Jesus Christ, and we're going to high-five and celebrate. We're going to see baptisms at the lake, and it's going to be awesome. People are going to be getting baptized, coming out of the water. There's no joy like seeing a person come out of the water. Woo! Right? Praise God. This is why I tell you don't miss baptisms. It's awesome to see those people. And it's many victories. And we're going to see marriages that are falling apart. And as the church, we're going to stand strong. And they're going to come back together. And they're going to be a model marriage. And we're going to celebrate them. And we're going to see people who are on addiction. And we're going to see them broken free from that. And they're going to be proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see people who are, are sick and be healed. And children who are wayward. And they're going to come back. And they're going to bring their own children. And they're going to stand here and praise the name of Jesus. And we're going to high five. And we're going to celebrate. And we're going to say praise God because we're wearing Jesus' belt of righteousness. Righteousness. God calls us to be righteous. We have a responsibility to it. See, the church is just not a cruise ship where we show up, sit back, and go, Gonzo, bring me a drink. All right. Man, how's the pool? The pool water's not warm enough. You need to fix it, Buffy, right? No, we got a mission. We're a battleship. We enter the ship and say, Yes, sir, we're here to serve. And he stations us in the church and we unite together. The only thing stopping us is when we don't partner with Christ. We don't partner with this, the church. We have a responsibility. We're on a mission. We're on a mission. Uh, the only thing that stops us is when we refuse to serve. We refuse to grow. We refuse to give. We refuse to group. We refuse to show up and attend. That's what stops us. Because if we say, no, I'm part of this church, I've partnered with them, I believe in Jesus Christ, I'm moving forward with him, you're going to do those things. And when you do those things, you're going to see your life become all about Jesus, period. And he's going to change you and he's going to transform all of us because we are far better together than we ever are apart. And we're going to pool our resources, we're going to pool our knowledge, we're going to pool our abilities, and we're going to watch Jesus do some amazing, incredible things. What an awesome God we have. I challenge you to partner with the church. Just like David and Jonathan united together. And we're going to learn more about Jonathan next week. You're going to see how incredible this partnership was. Bow your heads with me. Close your eyes. Jesus, 
may you be glorified. Jesus, this is your ship. And we're not here just to relish in the goodness of who you are and reap all the benefits. We're here to serve. We're here to partner and join alongside of you, Jesus. And, and the amazing thing is when we do that, we still reap all those awesome benefits. We still reap them. But Lord, we're on a mission. You brought us to this earth for a reason. And until you take us away, we're not done. There is no one too young or no one too old. We are together, one church, hilltop, moving forward on mission for your glory and your honor. And may we take our responsibility as a partner with you. May we share that responsibility. May we unite with a common mission. May we give our resources. And may you be glorified because it is all about you, Jesus, period. We ask all these things in your name, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.